at 7 p.m. as our city erupts into cheers for the essential workers. Uh, we will pause sometime in, in those uh, five minutes and add our own uh, prayers for their safety and well-being. Well, as our operations director Brent uh, put it, there will be glitches and hitches, but hopefully spiritual riches for our evening together. The seven last words is a traditional way to mark this solemn and holy day. The service reminds us of the seven things that Jesus cries out from the cross in the hours that it takes to suffer and to die. Each reflection is just a few minutes, but I pray that each one will offer you spiritual insights into the redemptive acts of Jesus in his sacrifice for you and for me. Alicia will now offer our opening prayer. Loving God, you sent Jesus to this world to love it, to love us. We've turned away from that love. We have betrayed Jesus. We have denied him. We have abandoned, mocked, and crucified him. Have mercy, O oh God. Have mercy on us through Jesus Christ, our only hope. Amen. Nancy will lead us in our call to worship. Lent began in the wilderness. Join Nancy as she leads us in the call. Lent began in the wilderness. It concludes in Jerusalem. We now come near to the end of one story. Another will soon, will soon begin. We have followed Jesus this far. Today we remember how he faced betrayal, falseness, rejection, and torment. And we witness once more that Jesus taught and walked in love through every step of the journey. Join us as we sing together, O oh, love divine, what hast thou done? Hear now the first word of Jesus from the cross. As he was being hung on the cross, Jesus prayed, Abba, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In my years as your pastor, it's been my privilege to sit beside many beloved church members as they say their last words and take their final breaths singing quietly, praying softly, holding a hand or 
kissing a forehead. One of the things that has haunted me in the past several days is the news of how many people who are dying of COVID-19 are dying alone. Dying alone in a hospital room where no family members or friends can be with them because of the danger of spreading the virus. Or dying at home where perhaps nobody realized quite how ill they were or dying alone on the streets where they had been living. As Jesus dies, as he speaks his last words and draws his last breaths, there are people around, but most of those people are not his friends. And in some cases, they are his enemies. Enemies who are driving nails through his hands and his feet driving nails into the bare wood of the cross. Enemies who taunt him. Soldiers who mock him. Years before this final moment, miles away from Jerusalem on the slope of a hill, Jesus told his followers, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. But it's one thing for him to teach that on a Galilean hillside surrounded by adoring crowds. It's a different thing for him to actually do that in the presence of people who are torturing him, abusing him, and ridiculing him. Making him know that despite the presence of these onlookers and persecutors, he is being left to die alone. No one to sing to him, no one to comfort him or hold his hand. It would be quite dangerous to do that even if somebody wanted to. Still, I am reminded by these precious and perplexing words of Jesus, Abba, forgive them. Abba, forgive them. I'm reminded by these words that Jesus is actually not dying alone. There is still one who is with him, the same one who right now is with each person, speaking their last words and drawing their final breath. God have mercy, God have mercy. Carter will bring us the second word from the cross. Good evening, friends. A reading from Luke 23, verse 43. Today you will be with me in paradise. Earlier in this gospel, in this scene, we learn that Jesus is being sentenced to death alongside two other folks that day. But Luke is the only gospel writer who includes those folks' voices. We thought you were the Messiah, one of them says. Save yourself and us. The other person asks, Jesus, the three of us are about to die. Aren't you scared? And finally, one pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In Luke's gospel, Jesus hears the voices of these two strangers as the three of them wait to die together. And Jesus doesn't give them a straight answer. He doesn't tell them he's not scared. He can't say whether he can save them or not. He doesn't use his privilege to get him out of this one. All he can say is, truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, Luke doesn't say if the conversation kept going after that. And Jesus doesn't explain what he means by paradise. Surely these strangers are as far from paradise as can be. Maybe in the midst of everything that was going so horribly wrong, it was all Jesus could do to offer an ear to the two strangers alongside him, to offer his presence to them. Maybe paradise means 
a world where kings suffer with the suffering, where rulers shed their power and lay down the tools of murder. Or maybe in crisis, we don't know what paradise is at all, but it's all we can do to remind each other that we're not alone. Do any of us really know what to say to each other right now in the midst of so much grief with so much that's unknown? Good Friday is a really hard day and we ourselves are in the midst of some really scary times. But within the crises of our time and within the anguish of Good Friday, this conversation Jesus has gives us something to hold on to. For me, this scene shows Jesus role modeling a very human way of scraping together a bit of community in the midst of catastrophe, a way of holding on for the stranger next to you when you're at the end of your rope. Truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. But until then, until that paradise comes, Jesus stays with us. On the most nightmarish of days, Jesus journeys along with us, shouldering our pain, that it might be a little lighter than it was before. Amid all the grief knocking at our doors right now, may you each rest in this moment in the knowledge that God hears your voice when no one else does, that this community is in this with you, and that you don't have to go through this alone. Be at peace. Our next hymn is Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Third word is by David and Karen. The third word comes from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your child. And then Jesus said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. What a difference a day can make. Last night, Jesus and the disciples gathered to share a meal and to worship together. Now, all the disciples are scattered, isolated, and afraid. A few women and the beloved disciple 
have gathered at the cross with Mary, Jesus' mother, to risk being present at his unjust political execution. It was dangerous to be so close that day. They were surrounded by soldiers and a crowd filled with fear and hate and eager for a scapegoat to blame. With fear and isolation also comes distrust. Can I trust my neighbor to be safe? Will someone betray me if I protest unjust and unsafe working conditions? Who will I turn to if I lose my job? Even in the time of danger and isolation, Jesus urges us to draw our circle wider by building relationships of care. In this, a time of fear and isolation, many of us are separated geographically from family members and special friends. We can't visit or hug people for whom we care deeply. For me, one of those people is my mom, Mary Elizabeth. She'll turn 97 next month, and she's living in an assisted community in northern New Jersey. She lives in close quarters with 130 other residents and dozens of caregivers. I haven't been able to visit her or give her a hug since March 7th, and I worry that she might get sick, especially now when there are eight confirmed cases in the community. But while I'm here and she's there, her caregivers have become like her family. It is they that are ensuring that she stays safe and healthy. It is they that take the risk, in spite of fears, to go to work every day and care for mom and her friends. And I am deeply grateful to all of them for being her family, like her family now. As the virus spreads also to immigrant detention camps and into prisons, let us hear Jesus reminding us that we work for justice by caring and standing for one another. With over a million 600,000 sick and hundreds of millions across the globe without income, the pandemic disproportionately endangers and takes the lives of Black, Latino, and poor communities both here and around the world. So as we face this time of danger, fear, and isolation, let's listen. Jesus is asking us, who is in your wider family that you are being asked to care for? From whom are you receiving care? Bridget brings us our fourth word from the cross, all the way from California. Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma, sabastani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the passage, we hear Jesus' question if God has left him. A bloody and beaten Jesus wearing a crown of thorns hung from the cross in front of a crowd. From that cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the word sabastani is a cry of distress, it leads me to believe that Jesus is now reaching the peak of pain. After ridiculed and tortured for hours, this is the moment where his pain is at a new high and he begins to feel the most distraught. The idea of Jesus feeling betrayed by God at first seemed a bit odd to me, but after reflecting on my own struggles, I identified with the emotion Jesus expresses. Last year, I suddenly got very sick and needed to take medical leave from school. What used to be a very healthy and active student disintegrated into a shell of a person that weighed 90 pounds, was unable to eat or drink, 
ran dangerously high fevers, and struggled to walk independently because of the physical pain it caused. Unbeknownst to me, I began struggling with an autoimmune disease and found myself rehabilitating from the hospital for months. Fortunately for me, with the help of a smorgasbord of strong medication, intense diet plans, skilled health professionals, and countless hours of prayer and meditation, I was nursed back to health. Like Christ, in my own darkest moments, I found myself questioning if God had left me. My sudden standoff with mortality prompted my own theological tug of war. I echoed questions similar to rappers like Nipsey Hussle and Tupac Shakur. Does heaven have a ghetto? Is there a special place in God's heart for outliers, those that suffer? Does God really keep me in mind when I experience pain? When I've suffered, my heart deepens for those who have also experienced pain, and I can't help but believe the same is true for God. God does have a special place for those that experience pain because Jesus experienced pain on earth. Jesus did not want to die. He was scared to. We know that Jesus sweated blood at the mere knowing of his fate to come, but he did it anyway and chose to trust in God's plan. In times like this, where uncertainty is high, I find myself reaching the same conclusion. I have no choice but to put my trust in God. That is where I find peace. I have to trust that God is faithful to complete the good work God began because the alternative is too worrisome. The beauty of the struggle and pain isn't the pain, but in God's ability to sustain Jesus through the pain. God kept Jesus in the midst of his anxiety, questions of unfaithfulness, and at the peak of his pain. God had a plan even in it. I find peace in knowing that the same God that sustained Jesus in his darkest moments on the cross can still sustain us in the midst of our own struggles. Please join together as we sing the beautiful hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus, How Hast Thou Offended? Jenna brings us the fifth word from the cross. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, 
he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. I am thirsty is probably the most basic of the seven words of Christ. It's a sentence everyone at some point or another has uttered or acted upon. It's one of the most simple needs. And yet, in the midst of the theological weight of statements on forgiveness, paradise, and being forsaken, Jesus simply says, I'm thirsty. Sometimes, this is interpreted as showing us the most human side of Jesus. Sometimes, it's purely theological. Because of the complexities of who Jesus is, it seems likely that it's not an either-or situation. Jesus was known for holding what seemed to be completely different things, fully divine and fully human, a radical and a conservative, a criminal and a leader. So when he says, I am thirsty, maybe we can hold it in multiple ways, appreciating all the complexity of life in that statement. We can hold his humanity showing its most basic need. His ministry hearkening back to its earliest miracle of water into wine at a family wedding. His conversations going back to that woman at a well who would never thirst again after she had the everlasting water. His revolutionary self thirsting for the fullness of justice and a kingdom to be realized. His divinity thirsting for the completion of a prophecy from long before his physical birth and to return to the Godhead. A thirst from all aspects of love and peace and compassion and goodness as he never knew them on earth. Or maybe it was something else entirely. Maybe it's a thirst for the joy and the blessed assurance that comes from knowing all things will one day be well. That in the midst of the deepest, unquenchable thirst, there is the knowledge that the kingdom will come. Earth will be as it is in heaven. All will have their daily bread. All will be delivered from evil. All will be made new, and there will no longer be a thirst for anything, because the kingdom is at hand. Before we move into our sixth word, we want to pause for a moment and remember those who don't have a choice to stay home or choose not to stay home because what they do is essential for the survivor, survival of the rest of us. Here in New York City, we can begin to hear the, the clanging of pots and the clapping of hands and the shouting of shouts as our streets outside this church fill with the sounds of love and appreciation for our medical workers, our nurses, the doctors, the orderlies, all the people who make hospital possible, the janitors, custodians, the food service people, but not only there because this battle is being fought on many fronts. There are the food delivery people. There are the trash collectors and the sanitation workers, people from all over in many walks of life who are on the front lines and will help us to working together defeat this disease before it hopefully takes too many more lives. So we'll pause quietly and take in the sounds if you are somewhere where you can hear them. And otherwise, please say a prayer for those essential workers. Thank you, God, for the gifts that 
these precious people are giving every day, every hour, every minute. Bless them, keep them safe, keep them well, keep them strong and without fear. In your name we pray it, amen. Our sixth word from the cross comes to us from Virginia on the lips of Anna. John chapter 19, verse 30 reads, And Jesus said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What meaning these words have for us right now? How we all long for our governors to say, it is finished, and to lift our stay-at-home orders. How we hope for the CDC to say, it is finished, and stop recommending social distancing. While tonight is the night we remember Jesus saying, it is finished. It is not yet the night we get to hear the words we so long for. So, what do we get to hear from these words Jesus said so long ago? I've spent a lot of time pondering that this week, and in my attempts to wrap my head around what Jesus might, meant, might have meant, I thought about times in my own life when I have said, it is finished. Like when I graduated high school and said, it is finished, with excited finality, so ready to be done with that chapter in my life and move on to the next one. Or this week, when I chalk crossed off a Monday to-do list on my to-do task on my to-do list at work, and I said, it is finished. Matter of fact, just as a passing update to my boss. Or last spring, when I left the church I was very involved in during college, and said, it is finished, with resignation. Not ready to give up that chapter in my life or my love for that community, but knowing I was doing the right thing for myself. As with so many phrases in the English language, it is finished can mean something different as context and inflection change. So how did Jesus mean it? Maybe Jesus meant it is finished, matter of factly. In John chapter 19, 28, New Revised Standard Division version, there's a parenthetical note that states, in order to fulfill the scripture. At this point, Jesus has fulfilled all the prophecies from the Old Testament that he could fulfill while alive. So matter of factly, they have been crossed off the heavenly to-do list, and Jesus can give up his earthly life. Or maybe Jesus meant it is finished resignation. He has spent his whole life ministering, and I'm sure he had great ideas, as all pastors do, about what more his ministry could do with people. He just needed a little more time and money. But at this point, Jesus has been hanging on a cross, slowly dying for 12 verses. So with resignation, he gives up his earthly life as finished. Before I go on, Please remember, these are the musings of a construction worker, not a pastor. But I would like to think Jesus says, it is finished, with excited finality. He has fulfilled all the prophecies in his ministry, and now he's about to perform one last miracle. One big stand. Show us the power of faith. When Jesus says it is finished, he leaves his earthly body on the cross. And with it, we get a chance to leave our doubts, our insecurities, our hesitations, our anxieties, whatever it is that plagues us. So tonight, when we hear it is finished, we don't get to burst out of our homes and congregate in groups again. But we do get a chance to burst out of ourselves, to say it is finished, to those things that hold us back to leave those burdens behind on the cross and to join together as the body of Christ. Amen. 
In the years following the Civil War, still recoiling and recovering from the death and destruction of that time, the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby penned this beautiful hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. Let us sing it together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are friends fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting. Just beyond the river In the cross, in the cross Be my glory ever Till my raptured soul shall find rest Beyond the river. Pastor Lee, will you please offer us a word of prayer? Will you pray with me? God of mystery, we find ourselves at the foot of the cross tonight. We'd rather not be here. We'd rather leave. We would much rather look away, turn away, run away, but help us stay. Let us sit beside the loyal women who refuse to go. Help us remain here with you, Jesus. So we find ourselves at Galgotha, and we remember the night when love hung on a cross. Where are you tonight, Jesus? Where are the Golgothas of our moment? Who is crucified? sacrificed and thought disposable by the powerful, the elite, and us. You cry out to us from Chicago where your black body is ravaged by a virus that has unveiled a racist healthcare system long overdue for radical change. You are leaning out your window in Rio de Janeiro, banging pots and pans in protest against a president who claims this pandemic is a little flu. You'd like to be here, but you're working a shift on a New York City bus right now and can't stop for fear of losing a job, regardless of the risk to you or the family of five you go home to at night. The state makes a great effort to hide you away, Jesus, but you manage still to raise a sign in the window of a New Jersey immigration detention center that reads, COVID-19 is here. Jesus, you are here. Help us be here, too. You're forgotten by so many, but you sleep this night in a refugee camp outside of Syria, where 6,000 people are crammed into a space meant for a 1,000, and you wait for medicine and food. It may not come. You worked as admin for a business and are deemed essential, even though they only pay you $10 an hour, you have to keep going to the office despite your kids being home from school and no one to care for them. You only barely survived the first round of layoffs and you can't rock the boat. You are nameless and homeless, one of too many just like you, who no one has claimed and who is bound for a mass grave 
on Heart Island. Jesus, you brace yourself when you have to leave your home because you know you'll receive racialized torment and abuse. When people do not see proud Chinese ancestry on your face and instead see blame. You're on Rikers Island, there for a parole violation, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, nobody caring that you have a cough, that you're feverish, and that you've asked for a doctor. Jesus, you are here. Help us be here too, with you, with your beloveds. God, guide us as we examine within ourselves how we participate and perpetuate the systems and the behaviors and choices that crucify love in our midst, that attempt to quash the power of a rising people against occupations and oppressions of all kind. Let us look deeply into our souls to purge the privilege that keeps some on the cross and others unaware of the deaths all around us. Help us not abandon you, Jesus, or the others who are crucified even now. Let us mourn with those who mourn, cry with those who have no more tears, and stand steady beside those that know the price and penalty of the cross in this failing world. We find ourselves at the foot of the cross tonight. Help us remember when enemies plotted against you and even your friends turned against you, you loved. And when the officials interrogated you and you were convicted of crimes against the occupying government, you loved. And when the crowns taunted you, guards tormented you and tortured you, you loved. And when the world killed you, Jesus, you forgave and loved us still because you believed we were worth it. God, help us be worthy of a love that gave everything. Help us as we stay and we watch and we wait. Amen. In this last song, we ask each other and we ask ourselves, were you there as we also ponder? Are we here? In the words of this great African-American hymn and spiritual, let us sing together.
Jessica will bring us our seventh word from the cross, the final words of Jesus. And following that, Jane will share with us her song, The Darkest Hour. The seventh word is from Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Abba, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. It was at this moment on the cross that Jesus finally surrendered, succumbed, submitted to the circumstance of the cross. Jesus let go and gave it up to God. Jesus commended his spirit. Commend or commit here means to entrust something to another for care and safekeeping. Had Jesus continued to resist, continued to cling to what had been, to what, it, to what is, rather than entrust his life and death to God, resurrection would not have been possible. For us Christians taking inspiration from Jesus' life, trying to emulate in our measly way, his way of being, what can we learn from this moment of surrender? In our current situation for me, I have learned to move to a place of acceptance. This is it for now. I must give in to the constriction of a face mask, the confinement of our apartment, feeling awkward as I avoid people in the grocery store, seeing my mother for brief fleeting moments on the street as we pass off food and vitamins from a safe distance. Only when I accepted this truth, this situation we find ourselves in, was I able to see the possibilities of what could become the joy in rekindled connections, the opportunities for solidarity, service, care, and action for justice, the recognition of our interconnectedness, and the signs of hope for a new world. I am reminded of Sufi poet Jalaluddin Rumi, who wrote in his poem, Love is the Master. God is working everywhere, the massive resurrection. How can we pretend to act on our own? I know that Jesus died today and Christ will not rise for three more days. And we celebrate on Sunday, but it's difficult for me to separate the two, the death and the resurrection. When we are in the pit of despair, and entrust or commend our lives to God in that moment, give ourselves up to God for safekeeping. We begin to see the budding resurrection, even as we stare death in the face. Amen. It became cold And the sky fell black Only the truth left standing And it was breaking the world's back A gift was never greater it wasn't just a man who died God's wisdom was crucified When Jesus died And the truth came Faith is given sacrifice. 
Friends, I ask that you would please come back onto video if you have uh, stopped your video. And I also ask that you would take your cursor, put it to the top of your box and release yourself from speaker view, pull into gallery view. And I hope that what you will see is your screen fill with the precious faces of our community. And I invite you to do something with me. I invite you, even though we are looking at different screens and different boxes to the right and left, I ask you to kind of suspend your disbelief and raise your hands and place your palms to the outside of your box. And you will be essentially holding the hands of those on the edge of the box right next to you. I hope that you feel this connection that you see these hands and faces and that you feel in this moment less alone because you are not alone. 
we are still together. We are still community and we are still church. And may we receive this blessing while we hold our hands. Let us pray. Keep watch, dear God, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Jesus. Give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, for we know you are one of them. You are one of us, and all for love's sake. Bless us as we scatter this night and wake us in the morning. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Be at peace.